She had everything a woman could want. She had it all. The family, the career, uh, the success within the community. She made a fortune in the boom years of the 1980s. Well, she was a, a smart person. She knew the industry. She had a rich doctor for a husband. They made a very nice couple. Uh, they looked terrific. And she was a rising star in the Maryland Republican Party. But when she lost her bid for the GOP Senate nomination in 1994, Ruth Ann swore revenge. A staggering tale of ambition, greed, and murder for hire. Next on Snapped. From her second story office in her sprawling Tudor style home, Ruth Ann Aaron could see the evidence of her success. Custom cherry woodwork framed a window that opened up on the wealthy and exclusive world of Potomac, Maryland. For Ruth Ann, it had been quite a climb. Ruth Ann Aaron had been born Ruth Ann Greenswig in 1943 in upstate New York. She grew up poor and she and her family struggled to get by. She's got blue collar roots. Her parents owned, you know, a small restaurant in their hometown. Both. Her father and her mother worked in the restaurant pretty much 24 hours around the clock. Ruth Ann worked with them, and she never stopped working. She had lots and lots of drive, lots of ambition, lots of intensity. She was determined to make it, and you did get the feeling she pulled herself up. Her mind got her out of the restaurant and into Cornell University. There she earned a degree in microbiology and the love of a pre-med student named Barry Aaron. They married in 1965. He was very charming, down-to-earth, friendly, totally supportive husband. So unlike Ruth Ann, who tends to have what we call narcissistic tendencies, that tendency to see themselves as special and unique, those types of women tend to be drawn towards and only drawn towards those people who have high status and who can make them look good. By 1972, Ruth Ann and Barry had two children, Joshua and Dana. When Barry finished medical school, the couple settled with their young son and daughter in Potomac, an exclusive suburb of Washington, D.C. In Montgomery County, it's one of the wealthiest, most educated counties in America. By 1984, Barry's urology practice was a booming success. The couple became players in Potomac's high-powered social scene. They would be at every single major black tie event that, you know, that raised money for something. Um, they made a very nice couple. Uh, they looked terrific. She, uh, you know, she always presented herself well. She was always well-dressed. Dressed for success, in Ruth Ann's case. In her spare time, she began buying distressed property and soon had started her own development business. Ms. Aaron was a land speculator and desired to become an honest-to-God developer. It was a very important moment for her that she could now connect with status and a sense of achievement and approval and admiration outside the family. The real estate boom of the 1980s turned out to be a gold mine for her. I don't know of a single property she bought as a land speculator that wasn't profitable. But Ruth Ann's taste of success only seemed to whet her appetite. The money was nice, but in Potomac, the real action is in politics. She was somebody who wanted very much to be an elected official. She got a real uh, desire to, as we say in politics, have, wear a silk hat. Politics is really a wide open candy store for pathological narcissism because each vote is often taken as an indication that somebody out there loves you, admires you, likes you, and wants to give you their vote. She started in 1992 with an appointment to the planning board, the most influential agency in the county. She was driven. She was focused uh, in a way that you don't see a lot of people that driven and that focused. I mean, even most politicians take time off to spend with their family or go goof off. And Ruth Ann Aaron made deals. And Ruth Ann was good at making deals. She leaned on people in the community who had expertise in politics. And she was a very shrewd, savvy politician. Extremely competent, knowing what she wanted to do. Very clear in her goals. A race for city council would have been the next logical step. But Ruth Ann had bigger dreams than that. After all, she'd never failed at anything before. 
Why not go big? The next thing I know, I pick up the newspaper, and she's running for the U.S. Senate. She was well put together, elegant without being fussy. She had the package. She had the total package. And I thought this was an up-and-comer. Looking at her, if you were to watch her in action, too, um, she could be utterly charming. Ruth Ann's opponent was former Tennessee Senator Bill Brock, head of the National GOP. She was in for the fight of her life. She liked a good fight. Uh, she was ambitious. She didn't mind taking chances. And she would, uh, you know, uh, if you got a problem with that, let's go out in the alley and, you know, we'll fight. During the campaign, the primary, where she was doing pretty well, uh, she was apparently in the polls running pretty close to him. Against all odds, she was winning. Then, the Brock campaign got wind of a couple of real estate fraud cases from 10 years earlier. A bunch of investors sued Ruth Ann, um, saying that she had duped them. And they filed a civil suit. And testifying against Ruth Ann Aaron were two lawyers who knew the case well, John Harrison and Dorothy Kahn. It then came out about this verdict that had been entered against her for fraud. Bill Brock picked up on this information and said that she had been convicted of fraud and running afoul of the law. When her poll numbers tanked, Brock easily won the election. Ruth Ann was livid. She blamed her loss on Kahn and Harrison, the two lawyers who had testified against her 10 years earlier. Ruth Ann Aaron just grew to hate those two men and saw those two men as the reason she was not a U.S. senator. When you attack a pathological narcissist, you don't just hurt their feelings. You threaten to take away the defensive shell that they've built around this core sense of themselves. So the reaction can be quite dramatic, quite sudden, quite unexpected, and in some cases, quite violent. Luckily, Ruth Ann had her family to support her during the tough times, especially her husband, Barry. He was always very attentive to her, you know, he, he was almost uh, secondary to her. She was always kind of center stage. You know, he was always going to get her something to drink, and he was always very, very um, aware of where she was and what was going on. It didn't take long for Ruth Ann to rebound from her defeat, or so it seemed. But Ruth Ann's next political battle would reveal more than just her unbridled ambition. It would reveal that far from being the perfect political couple, the Aarons were finished for good. Ruth Ann Aaron had come a long way from the small diner in upstate New York. Here's somebody who already had everything. I mean, nice car, nice house, uh, doctor, husband. What more could you want? This is a woman who went to college, uh, had children, went back to college, put her husband through medical school, becomes a pillar in the community, becomes a millionaire real estate developer, um, and runs for the U.S. Senate. She may have lost her Senate race, but that didn't mean she was turning her back on politics. Far from it. There's a lot of social rewards for going into politics. People look at you. People perceive you to be somebody important. And to a person like Ruth Ann, a woman who had been at the lower level of the economic background, now has gone to the top echelons of society, and that would be very important to making her feel worthwhile. In 1997, Ruth Ann began a run for city council. As always, one of her biggest supporters was her husband, Barry. She and Barry were a hit um, within political circles, absolutely. Again, he was um, very charming, down-to-earth, friendly, totally supportive husband of his very successful wife. As the election approached, Ruth Ann looked like a shoe in for the Potomac City Council. Then, on the 2nd of June, the Potomac police got a very peculiar phone call. According to landfill owner Billy Mossberg, Ruth Ann Aaron had recently contacted him and asked if he knew where she could hire a hitman. She called me and she says, can I meet with you? So we ended up going to J.J. Muldoon's. My ulterior motive was that J.J. Muldoon's had a big screen TV and an NASCAR race is on, so we go in there, I position myself to see the, uh, the race, and she started talking, and I started watching the race. And she was telling me that she wanted people eliminated. It was pretty hard for the cops to believe. You had, since polar opposites here, you had one of the senator and political bigwig from Potomac, uh, 
being land developer, talking to uh, a fellow who owns a dump. To make sure Billy was telling the truth, the cops tapped his cell phone and told him to call Ruth Ann from the precinct parking lot. It was less than a minute she called back. I told her, I, I got somebody can help you. One sergeant says to the other sergeant, what do we got? The guy says, we got the mother loot here. But so far, no one knew who Ruth Ann wanted whacked. Or why. Detective Terry Ryan went undercover, pretending to be the hitman recommended by Billy Mossberg. On June 7th, he got a call from Ruth Ann. Interest was to, to make very clear what it was she was wanted done, and, and she did so with me uh, by saying, uh, I want to see someone in the obits. Is that, is that too blunt? And who was it Ruth Ann wanted off? The, the detective asked her, okay, and the victims? And she spells out the name of the attorney. An attorney, Arthur Kahn, who she had met, had been involved in a, um, a court battle with uh, a short time before. The same Arthur Kahn who had helped torpedo Ruth Ann's run for the Senate back in 1994. It wasn't hard to guess why she wanted him dead. You could understand why somebody would hate Arthur Kahn. Not enough to kill him, but I mean, you could understand. Because he's brash and bold and full of himself and very cocky and just an amazing guy. But Ruth Ann wasn't done naming names just yet. Shortly after asking to have Arthur Kahn killed, Ruth Ann added another name to the list. And this one surprised everyone. Her husband's. And we thought, okay, she wanted Arthur Kahn. And then she says, and the second, and she spells out, Aaron. Hey, you want careful? Uh -huh. The methodical nature of that, just reciting it like she was ordering something from a store. It sent chills down your spine. It seemed her marriage wasn't quite as perfect as Ruth Ann made it out to be on the campaign stump. The Aarons were heading for divorce court. She was angry that Dr. Aaron had um, talked to her about the fact that he was now ready to move on with his life, that he thought the marriage had been over for some time, that he would never do anything to hurt her and her campaign, but he couldn't wait. He couldn't put his life on hold any longer, and it was time to move on. Ruth Ann seemed to have come to the conclusion that being a widow would be less damaging to her political career than being a divorcee. I think that she thought it would hurt her campaign. I think she wanted to portray herself as a successful businesswoman, a successful wife and mother. And I think that she thought that it would impact on that. After that phone call, events moved quickly. Ruth Ann and the hitman agreed on a price. $10,000 was discussed for the first job. I asked for a uh, $1,000 down payment up front money. And she negotiated that down to a $500 payment. The drop would take place on June 9th. She would leave a package for me at a local hotel um, stating that um, a person who was a guest at the hotel and represented a fictitious company would be picking up that package. Ruth Ann showed up right on time with the money. She was wearing a red wig with long straight hair, a floppy hat, a pair of large sunglasses, and a trench coat. She was arrested the same day on the charge of solicitation to murder. As far as the DA was concerned, the case was a slam dunk. But he'd never been up against someone like Ruth Ann before. And this bizarre story was only going to get stranger. Real estate developer and political player Ruth Ann Aaron's arrest for solicitation to murder had rocked the upscale Potomac, Maryland community. Montgomery County is sort of this white bread, leave it to beaver, all-American suburban bedroom community very wealthy we have a government that is beyond any kind of scandal um, our former county executive went on to the priesthood Ruth Ann's trial began on February 25th 1998 this was a very high-profile case and uh, we had media from all over the country if convicted on the murder charges she faced three life sentences but as always, Ruth Ann wasn't going down without a fight. She pled not guilty. 
It was going to be the toughest fight of her life. The evidence against her was overwhelming, beginning with 12 police tapes. You could not believe that they had such a complete accounting of Ruth Ann's walk down felony lane. They really uh, gave us what we felt was irrefutable evidence that she uh, wanted to have her husband killed and uh, the lawyer, Arthur Pan, killed, and that she meant it. And, and most importantly, that she uh, was uh, fully aware of what she was saying. In addition, there was physical evidence linking Ruth Ann to the crime, and lots of it. The trench coat, uh, the glasses, the wig, uh, were all found in her Jeep Cherokee. They found a couple of publications uh, from a, a, a publishing outfit in Colorado, the famous Hitman book. Uh, a couple of uh, manuals for manufacturing uh, silencers for revolvers and semi-automatic pistols. Materials for homemade silencers found in Ruth Ann's home matched diagrams in the manuals. In fact, there was so much evidence that Ruth Ann didn't even try to defend against it. She admitted to everything. Her defense was that she was crazy when she did it. The defense was that she was not criminally responsible and that she had a mental illness. And in the courtroom, Ruth Ann certainly looked ill. During her Senate campaign, she was a sharply dressed, well-groomed. To see her then in the courtroom, there's no other word for it, frumpy sweaters, no makeup, her hair not arranged, always manipulating this Kleenex in her hand, and at times during the trial, rocking back and forth. Brain damage, the defense claimed. Ruth Ann was unable to make sound judgments, and they brought in a team of top-notch experts to prove it. The defense team of psychiatrists, psychologists, uh, neurologists, uh, neuropsychologist, neuropsychiatrist put together a very broad band of diagnoses. She was manic depressive, she was bipolar, she was, oh, I mean, yeah, anything you could think of. There was no end to the clinical explanations. A dysfunction, an organic or abnormality with her temporal lobe that, that impeded her ability to function normally. The prosecution countered with experts from a local psychiatric hospital who denied it all. Ruth Ann's lawyers next claimed that years of sexual and physical abuse by her father had clouded her judgment. No evidence, said the prosecution. We spoke to a large number of people who had known her for years. They uh, said that she had never uh, made any disclosure or given any indication that anything like that had ever happened. Through it all, her attorney did his best to soften Ruth Ann's tough-as-nails image. Ruth Ann, her lawyer told the jury, was just an ordinary woman trying to please her husband. He took us away from that hard-driving politician to the woman who was trying to hang on to her marriage, and he talked about how she had had breast implants. In fact, Barry Aaron was made out to be the villain by the defense. The defense uh, lawyers essentially uh, painted him as a man who, who did anything he wanted to, that she was mentally anguished by, by his carrying on. Her husband's testimony did uh, support the view that the marriage was a very rocky and tumultuous one with, with a lot of uh, ugly scene. But was it ugly enough to make Ruth Ann insane? That would be for the jury to decide. Closing arguments were made on March 25th. The jury was out for five days, but no one was worried. Everyone knew what the verdict would be. Then came the stunner. The jury was hung. There was one juror who uh, was not uh, willing to uh, uh, change her views. So it was clear uh, from my notes from the jury and my conversations with the juror that... Uh, they were not going to be able to reach a unanimous verdict, so I was going to clear the mistrial. That juror uh, was an instructor for uh, emotionally uh, disturbed children. She uh, believed that uh, she was emotionally disturbed with that, and that she didn't think that uh, punishment was the appropriate remedy for that. Ruth Ann Aaron was free. She got away with it, at least for a while. Almost immediately, the state of Maryland began proceedings for a retrial. And once again, 
Both sides were gearing up for a major battle. But just as the trial was set to begin, Ruth Ann did something completely out of character. She gave up and pled no low contender or no contest. She wanted essentially to throw in the towel. At her sentencing hearing on November 22nd, Ruth Ann spoke in court for the first time. Her main concern was her children, Joshua and Dana. What I remember of seeing the raw emotion come from that woman, raw emotion, real emotion, was when, at her sentencing hearing, apologizing to her children for what had happened. She offered them her heart and ended by reciting a Yom Kippur prayer she had learned as a child. Ruth Ann Aaron received two 18-month sentences to be served consecutively in the Montgomery County Detention Center. This woman in Potomac who wants to conquer the world, who will do anything to eliminate her enemies and, and anyone who stands in her way, you know, it's, it's like a bad movie script. It is an American tragedy in a sense that she had a lot of very good people that believed in her. And then she went off and did this. For glamorous Joyce Cohen, every day was party day. Yeah, expensive jewelry. Five or six fur coats. Her husband was a multi-millionaire Miami builder. Stan was Joyce's prince. She had a coral rock mansion in Coconut Grove, a Jaguar XK, and her own private jet. In my life with Stan, a lot of stories say it was a Cinderella story. Uh, and it was, it was great. But when someone crashed Cinderella's party, Joyce's world shattered. Greed, drugs, jealousy, and murder. Next, on Snapped. Joyce Cohen had it all. Her husband was a multi-millionaire contractor. She had beauty, friends, taste, and style. Her luxury mansion, high on Silver Bluff, above Biscayne Bay, was the envy of Miami. Very old Coconut Grove home. This is a house made of coral rock many, many years ago. With its handmade tile floors, cypress paneling, and old world charm, it was the height of luxury. But Joyce was no homebody. She was A-list at South Florida's finest nightclubs. That Joyce had reached such heights was all the more precious because Joyce started life at rock bottom. I grew up in about 27 foster families. Um, was in St. Vincent's, Vincent's Orphanage in Freeport, Illinois when I was little. I got shifted from relative to relative for a while. She was um, abused as a child, and it was a really harsh life. There definitely are scars, especially when you're bounced from one foster care to another, so it's like no one ever loves you. You're never good enough for one family to hold on to, um, and that sort of makes the situation worse and worse. After a brief failed marriage, Joyce headed south to Miami. She saw the opportunity, the bright lights, the big city, and this is where she came. There she found a job writing mortgages at a construction project in Broward County and soon caught the eye of a wealthy Miami builder named Stan Cohen. Stan was the major partner in SAC Construction. Those initials are Stanley Ray Cohen. Stanley was a wonderful businessman, highly respected. He was extremely organized, very honest. In Miami's sweet, sultry heat, Joyce and Stan fell in love. She was 17 years older. She was uh, in her early 20s. She represented an innocence and a vulnerability that Stan liked. Joyce saw him as strength and something she never had, security. And uh, he really seemed to love her. You've got the father figure part of it, somebody older that's well-established, that's got their life in order, and so you can walk in and have this secure, safe, life or someone's going to take care of you. That Stan had been married three times before didn't worry Joyce one bit. Six months after meeting, the couple eloped to Las Vegas. They were 
very much in love uh, with each other. To me, it was a Cinderella story, maybe because of where I came from. Stanley certainly showed Joyce a great life that any normal working girl could never possibly have had. Took her all over the world. He had jet airplanes, he had cars, money, everything. Joyce worked hard to make her new husband happy. She was sweet, and she really had the Jewish traditional dinners with his parents, and they helped take care of his father and mother. Things may have been peaceful and sweet inside the Cohen home, but outside, Miami was raging. Miami was a hot place back in those days. There was a lot of money in Miami, and a lot of drugs, and a lot of murders and killings. In Miami at the time, home invasion, robberies, uh, were occurring on a regular basis. The serpent in paradise in 1980s Miami was, of course, cocaine. People were robbing and killing for it. For protection, Joyce and Stan put in a high-tech alarm system and a low-tech one, a ferocious Doberman named Mischief. As soon as your car got anywhere near the driveway, Mischief would start going crazy, barking and yelling and screaming. And if she knew, you know, she would let you in the house. But she didn't. She would carry the kids. Nearly as ferocious were Stan's son and daughter from his first marriage. Gary and Jerry did not take well to having a stepmother young enough to be their sister. Stanley's children never approved of Joyce and Stanley's relationship, especially Jerry, the daughter, who felt a great rivalry for her father's affections. Those situations are very complicated where you have, you know, an older gentleman marrying somebody that's younger, and then they've got these kids that are about the same age as the new wife. So, you know, you take it from the kid's perspective, it's hard to imagine why this woman would want to be with their father. So for them, in that situation, it would seem like maybe they couldn't understand why she would marry him unless it was for his money. And the money was rolling in. Miami was in the middle of a building boom, and Stan's construction business was booming right along with it. Soon, the couple began taking frequent ski trips out west. They took a lot of trips with a ski club. On one occasion, when they were in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, they decided this is the place for us. Joyce and Stan built a vacation ranch outside Steamboat Springs called Wolf Run. Stan loved it. He was a cowboy at heart. He, he loved just being able to be his natural self in his old torn jeans and throw on a hat. It was in Steamboat Springs that Joyce began to come into her own. She's from a very shy, demure girl to a sophisticated, well-dressed, wealthy woman. With Stan spending more and more time in Florida, Joyce became the toast of Colorado's celebrity ski crowd, and the crowd did a lot of toasting. There were several incidents where uh, she got wasted in one of some of the nicer restaurants in town, and Stanley wasn't happy about that. To lure Joyce back to Florida where he could keep an eye on her, Stan bought Guccione's, a restaurant in Coconut Grove, and put her in charge of running it. And here was Joyce, creepy at the door, dressed to the eyes, made up beautifully. I think that Joyce did grow up a lot in those years, and that she made a place for herself, and she made some of her own friends, and that was a good thing. The once shy and sweet Joyce had evolved into the life of the party. But as Joyce and her wealthy friends partied the night away at Buccioni's, Miami was evolving into an ever more violent and dangerous place. And that violence was about to change the Cohen's life forever. Snuggled up to her multi-millionaire husband, Joyce Cohen was loving the hot, sexy nights of South Florida. Her coral rock mansion perched high above Key Biscayne was oceans away from the Illinois orphanage where she grew up. Stanley and Joyce appeared to have it all. They, they, they appeared to be happy, successful, healthy. But all that would change in the early morning hours of March 7th, 1986. Wait a minute, stand on that. Try to calm down, okay? Okay, all right. We got it all safe, The 9-11 call came into Miami Police Department at around 5.30 in the morning. It was a frantic call from Joyce, uh, basically stating that uh, she needed the police and rescue that her husband had been shot. When the cops got to the Cohen mansion, they found Stan face down in bed. 
It was a very bloody scene. They found that he had been shot four times in the back of the head. He was dead. The front door glass was shattered, but nothing was missing from the house. While the crime squad searched for clues, detectives took Joyce to the police station for questioning. Between sobs, she told them it was a home invasion robbery turned tragic. Earlier that night when she was downstairs, sorting clothes for a rummage sale, Joyce said she heard a noise in the driveway. I called my husband, and he got a gun out of the drawer and went outside. But Stan found nothing, and he put his 38 on the nightstand and went to bed. Hours later, still downstairs, Joyce heard breaking glass. It was almost 5.30 a.m. I started to go to my husband, and I saw the back of someone, and I kind of like froze, and they were like running out the door, and it sounded like they said, let's get the F out of here. The cops found her story plausible, at least at first. Home invasion robberies were pretty common, and uh, it, it could have been very, very possible what she was saying actually took place. But the more Joyce talked, the more the cops began finding holes in her story. As she went through the timeline and the chain of events with the policeman, the officer said, something doesn't quite add up. There were just too many inconsistencies in her, in her statement. When the questioning got personal, Joyce suddenly realized she was a suspect. Her mood and her tone changed. She became uh, very defensive. She told the police to get out of her house. That stopped everyone cold. While detectives went to get a search warrant, the crime squad was shut out of the mansion. The coroner even had to leave Stan's body behind. So the police have to get a search warrant, and Stanley Cohen lays dead on the floor on his back for seven hours before the police can get back into the house. Critical clues to the time of death were melting away in Miami's heat. The cops weren't allowed inside, but they could search outside, and there they made an important discovery. They found a 38 caliber revolver thrown into the bushes uh, in the front yard of the house. That revolver belonged to Stanley. It had been wiped clean of fingerprints, but it wasn't completely clean. The gun had, between the hammer of the gun and the firing pin, what appeared to be tissue paper. When they got back in the house eight hours later, search warrant in hand, tissue was the first thing they looked for. In the bathroom, there's a wastebasket. They find another tissue, and this one has Joyce's mucus on it and particles that might have been blowback from the gun. And the cops soon turned up other incriminating details. We found that uh, their, their dog, which is Dover and Pincher, uh, was locked up. The uh, alarm had been uh, intentionally turned off. That was enough to start an inquiry into Joyce's private life. We established that Joyce uh, had the cocaine problem. Some of the friends that she hung around with just like to do drugs. That's a huge reinforcer. You've got, you know, I, I use this drug, I become this other person, I'm free, I have no inhibitions, people love me. The cops also learned that because of her drug use, Stan was threatening divorce. He told our accountant, Jay Rosa, and a few other people, but, and he also told her, when I leave you, I will leave you penniless. Divorce was the motive the cops had been looking for. The investigators got together and uh, we all reached a consensus that Joyce uh, was in some way responsible uh, for the death of Stanley Cohen. And Stan's children agreed. Her stepdaughter, Jerry, a local TV reporter and anchor woman, told me, there wasn't much question when a woman is alone in the house with her husband and he's murdered, what else would you presume? Stanley's children were as convinced as I was that Joyce was the murderer and they couldn't wait for the police to do something. Immediately after the funeral, Gary and Jerry moved to protect their father's assets. I really didn't even have money to live. They went to uh, a judge and they were able to get everything frozen. The house in Coconut Grove, his cars, his bank accounts, all of his wealth. So after 13 wonderful years, Joyce's party had come to an abrupt end. The prime suspect in her husband's murder, the little orphan girl was back at the bottom. But so far, the cops didn't have enough evidence to arrest her. Joyce Cohen was in stormy waters. With her wealthy husband dead and her assets frozen by her stepchildren, she was the prime suspect in her husband's murder. 
But was she guilty or innocent? An opinion in Coconut Grove split right down the middle. There are many people who were friends of Stanley Cohen believe firmly that she committed and was involved in this murder. And many people you will find today who were her friends will say that she had nothing to do with it. The cops never doubted Joyce's guilt, but they didn't have enough proof to go to trial. They were stymied. The prosecutor was not ready to indict in the face of the circumstantial evidence that they had. We lacked a witness. We lacked uh, the ac any actual physical evidence to put that gun in her hand and uh, show that she killed Stanley or that she conspired with someone else to have Stanley killed. Then, several months later, a convicted felon doing time for home invasion robberies came forward with some information on Stan Cohen's murder. His name was Frank Zuccarello, and he claimed he knew Joyce from the Miami nightclub scene. Frank Zuccarello, who was a home invader from Broward County, um, who had been uh, charged with and convicted of a number of home invasion robberies, came forward and indicated that Joyce Cohen had hired him, Anthony Caraccio, and Tommy Lamberti to commit the crime. Police thought they finally had the break they were looking for. The problem was the other two felons denied all knowledge of Stan's murder. And when the cops brought up Zuccarello's name to Joyce, she claimed to have never heard of him. Prosecutors decided they still didn't have enough to arrest Joyce. So they waited, hoping something else would pop. What happened next was that the case dragged on for two and a half years. Stan's children, though, never let up the pressure, and finally in October 1988, prosecutors decided to go with what they had. They got to a point where it was now or never. On October 24th, 1988, at the trailer in Chesapeake, Virginia, where she was living with a new boyfriend, Joyce was arrested for Stan's murder. The trial began on October 10th, 1989. Charged with murder in the first degree, Joyce was facing Florida's electric chair. From their opening statements, the prosecution painted her as a gold-digging, drug-praised murderess. Luella DeVille. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Good thing I knew her. I would say, woo. Her motive? The motive in, in this case is, is very simple. It was, it was money. She had the, uh, the cocaine habit. She was going to be divorced. She was going to be cut off from the money, from the lifestyle that uh, she had grown accustomed to. Nonsense, said the defense. No wife today is left with nothing. I'm not stupid. I knew that if my husband and I divorced, I would get money. The prosecution had several issues to cover. The gun and tissue, the alarm system and dog. But their big gamble was the credibility of their star witness, Frank Zuccarello. Frank Zuccarello was a liar who was out to save his own skin and negotiate a better deal for himself while he was in prison. He got out of 411 years in jail to testify against her. She didn't love him anymore. She had everything to lose. She couldn't file for a divorce. She wouldn't get anything. She, you know, the guy we were going to kill was a respectable person, very well known, and she was known as a cokehead anyway. On the stand, Zuccarello seemed sure of his story. He had met with Joyce uh, at a restaurant. She had drawn him a map of the inside of the house, told her what she wanted to do uh, and how she would set everything up and uh, let them into the house, uh, upstairs to the bedroom. And uh, after they uh, shot Stanley, uh, returned the gun, and she was to dispose of it. But there was a problem with the time of death. Zuccarello swore the murder took place at 2.30 a.m., but the state's own medical examiner and expert witness, Dr. Charles Wentley, put the death closer to 5.30 a.m. The physical evidence was just as problematic for the prosecution. There was no way that you could explain all the physical evidence involved in this case. The tissue with Joyce's mucus and gunshot residue was critical. Prosecutors said she used it to wipe the gun. The defense said she blew her nose on it and the gunshot residue came from Stan's body. Then, mid-trial, the medical examiner changed his mind about the time of death. Through evidence on his body that was photographed, it was later determined by the medical examiner that he was killed around 2 to 3 in the morning. Which was exactly the time Zuccarello claimed. While the defense scrambled to field more medical experts, the prosecution dropped another shocker. 
One of the neighbors came forward and said that I had a house guest from out of town. He told me that morning that he had heard the gunshots that killed Stanley Cohen. What time was it? And his answer, which changed the course of the case, was it was 2.30 in the morning. And it got worse. They asked him, do you know how many shots were fired? Yes, I heard four shots. Do you know what kind of weapon it was? Yes, I was, I'm a trained weapons expert from the military. It was a 38, which was, which was, of course, the murder weapon. And if that wasn't enough, another neighbor came forward with some damning evidence. A neighbor across the street got home at 3.30 in the morning, and he did not hear any gunshots, but at 5.30 in the morning, heard the broken glass and then the alarm go off. There was only one conclusion, prosecutors argued. Joyce Cohen was a lying murderer. When the jury went into deliberation on November 14th, 1989, they had a lot to consider. Motive, the gunshot particles on Joyce's tissue, the time of death, and most of all, the credibility of Frank Zuccarello. It was not an easy decision. You can see the things about her and her situation that might add up to, yes, she committed this murder, but you can also kind of see the other side of it. The jury took three days to reach a verdict. They found Joyce guilty of murder in the first degree. In a sentencing hearing on November 21st, 1989, the jury was unable to choose between the death penalty and life in prison. With the jury deadlocked, the judge sentenced Joyce to 25 years to life in the Broward County Correctional Institute for Women. I, I wouldn't say it was a Cinderella story because obviously uh, Cinderella ends on a happy note and this one does not even come close to ending on a happy note. But according to Joyce, the real ending hasn't been written yet. She still has hope that one day she'll be released from the nightmare that began in the early morning hours of March 7th, 1986. And I'm very hopeful that the judge will see all of the uh, deception and the manipulations that went on, the withholding of information that could have helped me at the trial, the use of false and perjured testimony. I, you know, I have to believe someone's going to look at this sometime and say, you can't convict a person on this. Those who are convinced of Joyce's guilt often point to her background when they're looking for a reason she would commit such a horrible crime. But even that leaves a lot of room for doubt. If you look at female killers, um, you see things like abuse in foster care, um, and then you know fear of abandonment, fear of losing what they've gained. But then you also, obviously, if you put everybody together on Earth that has had those backgrounds, they're not all killing. Diane Zamora was every parent's dream. She was a very intense student. She wanted to be an astronaut. She was accepted at the U.S. Naval Academy, and she found her perfect wingman. David had his sights set on flying planes and being a pilot. But in November 1995, indiscretion would send their high-flying romance into a tailspin. He had driven Adrian home from a track meet one night and had had a sexual encounter there. There was only one thing to do. Star-crossed lovers, jealous rage, and a deadly weapon. Next, on Snapped. Diane Zamora had lofty goals. In fact, the Texas teenager aimed about as high as humanly possible. She was fascinated with space and she did want to be an astronaut. But what did she really want to escape? Earth's gravity or reality? Diane grew up in a working class, middle class family in an area, a bedroom community that was rapidly becoming more affluent. And the family itself had a lot of problems. Her father, who'd been caught several times, messing around with other women. Where a chaotic home life might have hampered 
with some kids, Diane's only made her more determined. She wanted to learn. If there was something she wanted to learn about, yeah, she was really interested in it, really into it. Diane was the kind of person who studied hard. She saw her self-concept as tied up into being this sort of achiever. At Crowley High School in suburban Fort Worth, Diane was the kind of girl's boys asked for answers to the pop quiz. She was not, however, the kind of girl they asked out on a date. Diane was somebody that would sit at the back of the room and make straight A's, but never really talk to anybody. Diane was all business. Finishing high school in the top of her class was top priority. Then, Annapolis. And once she was a naval aviator, she'd apply for astronaut training. She set her goals and uh, was determined uh, to accomplish her goals. She had her life planned out before her. I think Diane's interest in the military came more from the perspective of, I want to succeed because I see other people around me failing. And she decided at a very young age that she didn't want to be a uh, dropout. She didn't want to be a failure. But the initial step in Diane's plan came in 1991 when she joined the Civil Air Patrol. They do a lot of intro military type training. It was a club that a lot of the people that eventually end up in the military academies start out in. But it wasn't just the military Diane was attracted to. In the Civil Air Patrol, she met David Graham, a straight-A student and ROTC commander at nearby Mansfield High. David was also destined for the military. On days when there was a reason to, he came to school in his ROTC uniform, and his buddies at school called him Colonel Graham. Although rather than Annapolis, David aimed for the Air Force Academy. They both had the same ideas of using the military academies as a launching pad. Diane and David were a lot alike, so it was no surprise when the two started dating. It was 1995, the summer before their senior year. And uh, in August of 95, one of our mutual friends invited us to his house for the weekend. We both went, and over that weekend, Diane and I started getting close to each other, and by the end of the weekend, we were just inseparable. In the heat of the Texas summer, the budding romance got hot and heavy in a hurry. Their relationship just, just took off and became very intense very quickly. You couldn't get him apart with a crowbar. Their intense attachment struck some as downright unhealthy. To some, their relationship seemed to reveal a dark, controlling side of David Graham. A lot of their friends thought that they were together too much. They thought David was too domineering. We were talking, and all of a sudden, David got up and says, we're going to, it's time to go. Let's go. And she almost didn't say even goodbye. She said, well, I've got to go. And out she went. Well, David was the colonel, and orders were orders. Besides, Diane could be possessive, too. Diane was both a bit jealous and a bit fearful that he would fall in love with someone else. Which was understandable, considering her parents' marital difficulties. There was a long history of infidelity by her father, and she said that that affected her a lot. It made her less trusting of men. There were plenty of opportunities for mistrust. With summer over, Diane and David went back to finish their senior years. But they went to different schools. Diane went to Crowley and David to Mansfield, which meant they could no longer spend every day together. And David, who ran track, was teammates with attractive athletic girls like Adrian Jones. She was athletic to the extreme. She ran track, played basketball, volleyball, never met a stranger, very popular in school. Although not apparently very popular with David, at least not at first. I didn't meet her until she got on the cross-country team her sophomore year. And we really took no notice of each other. Why should they? David was in a committed relationship, and in September of 1995, Diane and David made their commitment official. They suddenly announced they were going to get married right after they both graduated from the academies. Well, a young woman in that situation has just found out her father has had an affair. It's probably going to approach relationships in a way that's, you know, full of fear. Some people might force relationships into being very serious and secure as soon as possible and make and do whatever they need to do to make sure that this, that security remains there. But the security of marriage would have to wait until after their military goals were achieved. We wouldn't allow you to be married to either company, so our plan was to get married exactly five years to the day, August 13, 2000, after just a few months after our military academy graduations. 
five years was a long wait. But for Diane and David, the wait would turn out to be even longer. Because instead of serving their country, the young lovers would end up serving time. December 4th, 1995 was a school day. Diane Zamora was in class at Crowley High, and her boyfriend David Graham was at his desk a few miles away at Mansfield High. But David's track teammate, Adrian Jones, was absent, and she wasn't cutting class. At about the same time Diane and David were settling into their homerooms, a local farmer made a gruesome discovery. He broke out his mailbox across the county road there onto his property, and he noticed what he thought was a girl. He could tell that she had been shot, I believe, twice, and said she was definitely dead. Within minutes, the farmer's field was filled with cops. Less than an hour later, they had the dead girl's identity, Adrian Jones. Uh, there was already a missing persons report on file in Mansfield for Adrian. Adrian's mother had called the cops that morning when she got up and discovered her daughter was gone. She also provided investigators with their first clue. Shortly before bedtime, Adrian had taken a phone call. There was a phone curfew about the time, but she let Adrian take the call anyway. Adrian told her it was a David from track. Questioned by the cops, David said he and Adrian had talked on the phone the night before, but that was all. Detectives interviewed David Graham. Mr. Nice Guy, Mr. ROTC, Mr. Senior Class, and just said, you know, couldn't be him. I don't think he was ever considered a suspect. Police talked to, if not all the kids in that high school, a great deal of them. None of the other kids knew anything about the murder. How Adrian wound up dead in a field that morning remained a mystery. You just can't imagine anyone would ever want to hurt her. There was no evidence of sexual assault. The police investigation had run into a dead end. They'd really gotten nowhere. Adrian's murder remained unsolved. Mansfield High eventually went back to normal, and David Graham graduated at the end of the school year. So did Diane Zamora. That fall, Diane left for Annapolis and David for the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. There were a couple of articles in the local papers here about, you know, boyfriend and girlfriend each received commissions to prestigious academies and that sort of thing. And so they got a little notoriety. They'd be back in the papers that fall thanks to a revelation that brought more than mere notoriety. It would make Diane the most notorious cadet in Naval Academy history. At the end of August 1996, nine months after Adrian Jones' murder, came a breakthrough in the case. Someone finally talked. Someone almost a thousand miles away at the Naval Academy in Annapolis. Late one night, in a dorm room conversation, Diane Zamora had made a startling admission. Diane told one of her roommates that she and David would always be together because they shared each other's fate. I don't know if they were talking about boyfriends or crazy things they've done or what, but sometime during that conversation, Diane blurted out, my boyfriend killed somebody for me. Diane's roommate reported her confession to her superiors. The Naval Academy has a, an honor code where you're supposed to report crimes or, or any kind of ethical concerns. The Academy started calling some of the local police departments in this area, inquiring as to whether a crime of this nature had been committed here. It had, of course. The murder of Adrian Jones. From Texas, detectives flew to Annapolis. When they interviewed Diane, she denied everything. Then the detectives headed to the Air Force Academy to talk to David Graham. And David, ever the dutiful soldier, told the cops everything. And then some. The same detectives, I gave them the statement, told them exactly what had happened, told them where the evidence was, told them everything they needed to convict me. And they arrested me. Started typing out this long, detailed narrative, talking about his love for Diane in, in almost poetic terms as well as intense jealousy and rage that led to this murder. The confession was a shocking retelling of the night of the crime, ending with the murder of Adrian Jones. I picked up the gun, which was now down on the floor of the car, went out there to her, and just kind of vaguely pointed the gun and shot once, got back in the car. Diane said, is she dead? Are you sure she's dead? Shoot her again, make sure she's dead. Then I went back out. 
got a little closer, fired two more times, got back in the car. Once the cops told Diane that David had talked, she followed suit with a confession of her own. She wrote one that was almost verbatim. The track is almost, almost, almost to a T. According to both Diane and David, the murder stemmed from a track meet in Lubbock on November 4th, 1995. David said that he had driven Adrian home from a track meet one night and that they had parked and had had a sexual encounter there. Racked with guilt, David had confessed his sin. And when he told Diane, she just went crazy. He ran into her bedroom and beat her head into the wall. And then she just went in and lay down in her bed and started weeping. David apologized and apologized, but it wasn't enough. There was only one way to make it right. Diane, by both of their accounts, demanded that Adrian must die. To erase this blot on our perfect relationship, you've got to kill her. A lot of times when people murder, what they want is they just think that all their problems will be solved if this person that caused them problems no longer existed in the world. In her mind, she felt like the only way to deal with his betrayal was to make sure that the girl that he was with no longer existed, that the betrayal was just wiped out. The twin confessions also explained in great detail how the murder occurred. David called Adrian that night, convinced her to sneak out of the house, and drove her out to a field. Then it happened. Diane crawled out from the back seat. Adrian turned and saw her and started panicking. Adrian began to fight very hard. And she was an athletic 16-year-old girl. And it was at that point that Diane struck her. Diane picked up a barbell from the floor of the back seat and hit Adrian with it. Diane dropped the weight and David picked it up, smashing Adrian's head a second time. Then Adrian managed to crawl out of the car window and flee. And she didn't have far. And that's when she ran through our fence and collapsed. And Diane told David to go after her. David walks over to her. She is helpless and lying on the ground. And then he shoots her twice. Diane Zamora and David Graham were arrested for murder. And tipped off by David's confession, the police recovered a gun a 9mm Makarov hidden in the attic of his parents' house. He liked it because it was the gun that the KGB used to use. Ballistic tests matched the gun with the slugs from Adrian's body. It's not American-made. It has a distinctive lands and grooves down the barrel. The gun appeared to be a direct link tying David to the murder. Against Diane, all the cops had were the lover's twin confessions. But prosecutors didn't think proving she was part of the murder would be all that hard. After all, Diane had always stood by him. As teenagers, Diane Zamora and David Graham were inseparable. The seemingly perfect couple that did everything together. Including, according to the Tarrant County District Attorney's Office, the murder of Adrian Jones. David and Diane acted together. Uh, they were both present at the crime scene. They both participated in injuring and, in fact, killing Adrian. And as the new year dawned in 1998, the two lovers were still together, more or less. In jail awaiting trial, they were held in separate cells. They wrote to each other. They tried to uh, shout messages to each other within the jail. They still had an ongoing relationship. But it was a relationship as doomed as Adrian Jones. After about seven months in jail, something just hit me. I looked back on all the letters from her and the time we had spent together before the arrest, and I said, no, no, this isn't right. This isn't how love's supposed to go. The breakdown between them would be on full display during their trials for murder. Diane's came first on February 2nd, 1998. And the prosecutors made it quite clear that it was Diane who was on trial. They painted her as a domineering, psychopathic mastermind of this whole plot. In Diane's mind, it was the ultimate test of love. Killing Adrian represented to her that David was willing to do anything, and it probably strengthened in her mind her connection with her fiancé. Diane, according to the prosecution, had killed for love. 
but she had little for David when she took the stand. They were willing to, to kill to stay together. So it, it must have been when the reality of the situation actually hit them that you know they're going to go to jail for the rest of their life and perhaps if they turn on each other, that may give them each a chance of a little shorter sentence. And she did turn on David and said it was all his fault, it was all his plan, it was all his doing. Diane was just warming up. She went on to describe a David Graham far darker than the ROTC commander classmates dubbed the Colonel. She described David as this violent, domineering boyfriend who collected guns and, and played with them in, in inappropriate ways. Sticking a gun in her mouth or other places. It bordered on, uh, on sadism. Everything was, David was this strange, uh, bloodthirsty, satanic, controlling, manipulative monster. The defense was also quick to point out that it was David that called Adrian the night of the murder. It was David's gun that killed her. And they suggested it was David, not Diane, that had bludgeoned the girl before shooting her. The indentation of the blunt trauma injury was very consistent, not with being hit with a weight, but with being hit with the butt of that gun. So why did Diane confess that she'd struck the first blow? According to her, it wasn't because of love. It was because of fear. She says, David intimidated me, David threatened me, David made me go along. It is very common for women to use victimology as a way to get out of murder charges because people give women the benefit of the doubt. They figure that women are the victims and they're the ones being abused. There was only one problem. The police weren't the only people she'd confessed to. Most murderers, and particularly women, always get caught because they can't keep their mouth shut. Killing makes them feel powerful. Diane told her roommates because it's a way of showing, hey, I've got a power, I've got presence, and I can do things that other people can't do. Roommates, the prosecution put on the stand. Each one uh, testified that Diane had said that Adrian deserved it because she'd been unfaithful or promiscuous. It was a very damaging testimony because each of these witnesses told a similar story about different things that Diane had told them individually. But was the naval cadet's testimony enough to blow Diane's defense out of the water? Her attorney didn't think so. They, they never said Diane went out in the field and was uh, a part of the killing, but they did support the fact that Diane said that David killed to prove his love. Maybe. But the prosecution had one last piece of evidence left. Diane's date book. In it, she had circled November 4th with the notation, Lubbock, the date and place of the track meet. And on December 4th, the night of the murder, she'd written, 1.38 a.m., Adrian. She had memorialized in her own handwriting, in her own date book, this very important event in her life. February 17th, 1998 would also be an important date in Diane Zamora's life. That's the day the jury found her guilty of capital murder. Diane's reaction to the verdict was very stoic. She looked sort of resigned to it. She'd better be. Sentenced to life in prison, it'll be 40 years before she's eligible for parole. With Diane's conviction, there wasn't much doubt about the outcome of David Graham's trial. We find the defendant, David Christopher Graham, guilty of the offense of capital murder as alleged in the indictment. Convicted in July of 1998 and also serving a life sentence, his trial was the last time the two lovers laid eyes on one another. She did not testify. She walked into the courtroom, looked David in the eye, and then walked out. And it was, it was very, a very powerful moment in the trial. There was still a lot of romantic tension between the two of them. A romantic tension that ultimately took the life of Adrian Jones. Either one of them could have said, let's not do this. This is crazy, but neither one did. They sort of fed off each other, and this crazy thing happened. I think you have two people who were rather codependent on their love for each other, and they'll do anything to preserve it because there's an obsession and a desperate need to be bonded with someone else. And if that bond breaks or is threatened to break, I think that some people will resort to murder.
prison rights who are teenagers or, you know, around 20 because they seek a man who is more mature, and most men reach somewhat more maturity around the age of 28. Jeff Wright was mature enough to realize that he'd found someone truly special. He had told me that he had found a girl who was the one. This was the one he was going to marry. This was going to be the wife of his kids. He was ecstatic. And Susan happened to step into the hard-living bachelor's life at just the right time. When Jeff and I would party, uh, anything went. I mean, uh, drugs, alcohol, uh, partying for days at a time, no sleep. Um, it was just completely out of control. Jeff said that Susan pretty much had saved his life, that she pretty much straightened, straightened his idea of where he wanted to be in life. He didn't want to be out running around drinking and hurting. He wanted to be home. He wanted to have a family. And, and he didn't have to wait long. Several months after they started dating, Susan dropped a bombshell. I think that when he found out that she was pregnant, that he wanted to do the right thing, and that he loved her. Uh, I don't think that he was necessarily ready at that point to be a father, but those things, you know, they, they just, they come along, and he grew into that situation, I think, quite well. He'd have to get ready in a hurry. By the time he'd made his proposal in October of 1998, Susan was more than just a little pregnant. I was um, eight months pregnant with my son, and we were in the truck, and he handed me the ring and said, will you marry me? I said, yes. It was Texas-style romance. Two weeks later, Susan said yes again, this time at a private wedding ceremony held outside of Houston. The blushing bride and proud groom commemorated the event with a big steak dinner. Their wedding night was spent at the Outback Steakhouse, you know, I think that... Uh, it's probably not what either of them had uh, envisioned it would be. Maybe not, but the Wrights couldn't have been happier. I think they did look adoringly close to each other. They hugged, they were affectionate, um, they held hands. I thought it was a very good relationship. Following the birth of their son Bradley in November, the young couple bought a fixer-upper in a suburb of northwest Houston. With Jeff's job selling flooring, the time seemed right to settle in. Bay Tree is a neighborhood made up of homes that were built in the 80s, uh, not big homes, 12, 13, 1400 square feet. Susan quickly turned the track house into a real home. The house was a typical middle-class all-American house, clean, pretty neat, kids' toys around, pictures on the fridge, all that. In 2001, the Wright's little house got a whole lot cozier following the birth of their second child, a beautiful baby girl named Kaylee. Jeff was so proud of, of his wife and kids, especially after Kaylee was born. With Jeff out pushing laminated hardwood flooring and linoleum tiles, Susan did her best to keep the home fires burning. They were more of a traditional family. He was the one who went out and worked. She stayed home to take care of the house and the kids and had dinner on the table when he came home. Women in our society, like Susan, are indoctrinated into this whole sense of perfection. They want to see themselves as this sort of Madonna character, the perfect mom, you know, the perfect wife. And it was very important for her to be that good girl that society and her family expected of her. If that perfection took a toll on Susan, neither her friends nor neighbors could see it. She was always giving me cleaning tips and cooking tips and how to get the baseboards clean and how to whip up this great three-course meal in 20 minutes. I would react like, I've got two small kids. It's not happening in my world. And she managed to do it all. By 1999, the Wrights had notched out a nice life for themselves. I think they were doing pretty good. I wouldn't say that they were rich. Jeff had a pretty decent truck. Susan had a nice car. There was even talk of building a new house for their growing family. He was making good money and, uh, in fact, was planning on building a new house and, at the time, shopping for a new car for his wife. Just shy of their five-year anniversary, the young couple looked to be on the verge of moving up in the world. But before they could break ground on a new house, an investigation would have cops doing a little digging of their own in the Wright's backyard. By 2002, Susan and Jeff Wright had been married for over four years. They had two beautiful children, a nice house in the burbs, 
and a growing bank account. To friends and family, the rights seem to have it all. Everyone described it as um, leave it to fever. And that's how I worked really hard to make things look that everything was perfect. But that all changed on the morning of January 15th, 2003, when Susan Wright walked into the domestic violence division of the Harris County Police Department. Accompanied by her mother, Susan claimed that Jeff had been abusing both her and drugs for years. But things had come to a head two days earlier when she finally confronted him about his problem. I told him that I loved him, but that he needed to get help. And I would stand by him if he got help. But if not, then I was going to leave. Susan said that he got mad. He ran up to her and grabbed her by her wrist and shoved her into the wall, screaming at her and just violently shaking her and slammed her over the wall during the entire time and left the house. And Jeff hadn't been seen since. Unable to locate Jeff and concerned for Susan's welfare, Deputy Hall rushed an arrest warrant through the Harris County District Attorney's Office. Susan appeared to be a, a victim of domestic violence. That's what I, I perceived at the time. Um, she was very tearful, crying a lot, um, acted extremely afraid of Jeff returning home. As police began their search for Jeff Wright, friends and family grew increasingly anxious about his whereabouts. Call his cell phone and we'll get uh, directly to voicemail. I thought that was very unusual because Jeff liked his job. We were concerned at this point that, uh, that Jeff may have, may have been in trouble. And what bothered me is, hey, he didn't call on our anniversary, which he was attending to dates, and uh, his truck was still in the driveway. On January 18th, just three days after Susan filed her complaint, attorney Neil Davis arrived at the sheriff's office. He told them he had a new client and that he knew where to find Jeff Wright. I gave a very limited amount of information, just explaining that there was a body at a certain location. Uh, that I was not personally involved in any way, uh, and to give them my business card. Following up on attorney Neil Davis's lead, police descended on the Wright's house on Berry Tree Drive. Neighbors watched in disbelief. I was watching the TV, and there was a police officer that showed up in front of Jeff's house, and the police officer informed us that there might be a dead person in there. I was amazed. Entering the Wright's home, one room in particular caught the cop's attention, the master bedroom. That was partially disassembled, mattress and box prints had been taken out of the room. The carpet where the bed had been located was partially cut out. Um, one of the walls above where the bed had been had been freshly painted. But police made an even more gruesome discovery just outside the Wright's bedroom door. There's a small area, a couple feet wide, uh, towards the front of the residence. It was just dirt, and that's where his body ultimately was discovered. Uh, face down, uh, mostly buried. The back of the head, uh, the left shoulder, and the left arm was exposed. He was face down in the dirt. Once the entire backside of the body had been exposed, I had seen Two injuries, clearly stab wounds. As for their chief suspect, well, it didn't take long for the cops to whittle down the list. Women, when they uh, commit spousal murder, tend to use a knife. They are three to four times more likely to use a knife than a man would. We figured the defendant was going to be Susan Wright because she was the only other grown up living there. But attorney Neil Davis was making it very tough for the cops to get to his new client, Susan Wright. He claimed she was in a psychiatric hospital and unable to be questioned. They played this game for a whole week of telling me every day, Kelly, we'll give you a statement, we'll give you a st They charged Susan with the murder of her husband and told her attorney to bring her in. But she didn't spend long in jail. She spent the weekend in jail and then she made her bond that following Monday. Maintaining Susan's freedom was now in the hands of her smooth-talking attorney, Neil Davis. But what Davis didn't know was that a dirty little secret from his sweet-faced client's past was about to come back to haunt them both. Susan Wright, devoted mother and housewife, faced a prison term of up to 99 years if convicted for the murder of her husband. 
Susan didn't deny stabbing her husband to death, but she claimed it was an act of self-defense. Before her trial even began, her attorney started laying the groundwork for her defense, which mostly involved Jeff Wright's character. Susan's attorneys very much sort of felt that uh, the court of public opinion would be very important, and they immediately began to portray her husband as this abusive, drug-crazed, misogynist. But as the trial got underway in February 2004, it was clear that slamming Jeff's character wasn't going to be enough. In their opening arguments, the prosecution laid out a damning list of physical evidence. To begin, they claimed that Jeff hadn't just been stabbed a couple of times. He'd been stabbed a lot. Like, 193 times. People were shocked. They couldn't imagine that such a pretty young thing, stabbing her husband 193 times. Women kill for a number of different reasons, and one of them is revenge. And I think stabbing somebody 193 times is what we call overkill. It means that you're not just killing, you're not just stabbing somebody to kill them. You're stabbing them to show them that you are angry. But it wasn't just the number of wounds that called Susan's self-defense plea into question. It was also the manner in which they had been delivered. According to the medical examiner, the marks around Jeff's wrists and ankles indicated that he wasn't attacking Susan when he was stabbed. He was lying on his back, tied to the bed. Mr. Wright was tied down and stabbed to death. He had ligatures on his arms, on his legs, and of all of his 193 plus stab wounds, only two of those were on the back, which again suggests that he was tied down and incapacitated while the injuries were being inflicted. But according to the defense, the number of wounds indicated that Susan was delusional from years of abuse. They had to use the battered wife defense to get to that many stab wounds. They had to set up a scenario to justify being in fear for her life, to justify having a knife in her hand and stabbing Jeffrey that many times. The defense also claimed the marks on Jeff's wrists were caused by Susan tying his hands to drag his 250-pound body to the hole in the backyard. She was clearly out of her mind, and uh, she was delusional. And she thought he was alive. She stabbed him, threw him in the, in the hole, thought he was still alive, so she began cleaning everything up manically, thinking that he was going to beat her if he didn't clean the house. And the defense argued they had the evidence to back up their claim. Jeff did have a prior charge. He had been charged before in Austin, I believe it was, for a, uh, a simple assault. It was with a, uh, a girlfriend at the time. Lead prosecutor Kelly Siegler painted a different scenario. If Susan had been a longtime victim of abuse, she argued, why had she waited until the morning of January 15th to report it? Two days after she had killed Jeff. We could find no documentation uh, where Susan had ever made any reports to the police about any kind of uh, physical abuse in the family. But the defense maintained that such instances weren't uncommon. If they go to the hospital and a doctor sees an abused woman, the woman is going to be fearful that the doctor will contact authorities and that's going to lead to more uh, abuse. True, but the prosecutors reminded the jury that this case centered on the issue of self-defense. And the facts surrounding the crime seemed to indicate something else. Premeditated murder. The prosecution contended that Susan Wright had lured her husband to bed that evening using the best weapon she had in her arsenal, her body. Around 9 o'clock, she brought Jeff into the bedroom, lit the candles, undressed herself, undressed Jeff, began to make love to him. She tied him up with his neckties, as tight as she could possibly tie him. She pulled the knife out and then started to stab him. And the prosecution brought out the Wright's actual bed to illustrate their point. Are these the pieces recovered from the scene or very soon? Yes, ma'am. Certainly the most sensational moment was when Kelly Sigler straddled her assistant district attorney to demonstrate how this could have happened. Susan denied the state's assertion. That wasn't in our relationship at all. 
I think it's disgusting. She just acted so, so offended that, you know, how dare I suggest that, that she would basically do anything besides regular, boring, missionary sex. And it's like, come on, lady, you got handcuffs in the drawer. To back up their claim that there was more to Miss Prim and Proper than meets the eye, the prosecution revealed a juicy chapter from Susan's past, one that suggested this innocent housewife wasn't quite so innocent. Susan worked as a dancer at a gentleman's club for eight weeks on Saturdays. Susan naturally downplayed it. When I was 18, um, right outside of high school, I wanted to make money to go away to college. I, I danced for two months, and I didn't like it, so I quit. Many young women that I talk to in my practice, if they come from a very religious background, many of them have views of sex that sexuality is very bad or negative. And in rebellion of that, they go out and they look for um, ways to express their sexuality. Could possibly be through prostitution, but also through, so through topless dancing or just exploring their bodies in ways that would be very much the opposite of how they grew up. Whatever Susan's reasons for taking it all off, the prosecution seemed to have scored a point with the revelation. I think it helped the prosecution, the fact that she had been a topless dancer, because she would often act prude, and Kelly would say things like, you danced naked for men. But all of the prosecution's arguments begged one big question. If Susan didn't kill her husband in self-defense, then why did she kill him? The answer was a bigger surprise than the stripping and revealed that Susan had more than one reason to want her husband dead. Susan had called uh, Jeff and uh, they began discussing an insurance policy that, uh, that Jeff had with our company. Jeff uh, said, said, don't worry, honey, if I die, you're going to be a very rich woman. Rich might have been an overstatement, but Susan did stand to inherit $200,000 upon Jeff's death. It was enough money, prosecutors contended, for Susan to start a new life for herself. Thank you. Please be seated. On March 3rd, the trial drew to a close. When the jury retired on March 4th, it took them only five hours to reach a verdict. They found Susan Wright guilty of second-degree murder for the death of her husband. I believe the jury, based on what they sentenced Ms. Wright to obviously believe that there was some validity to what she was saying. Now, there's an old saying at the courthouse, you play the cards you're dealt. And the prosecution was dealt a better hand. After her conviction, Susan was sentenced to 25 years at the William P. Hobby Correctional Facility. Many women in our society, like Susan, are brought up to be perfect, to be good homemakers, um, to be kind and to be gentle and to seemingly have this perfect life. She wanted to see her life as perfect as everything in its place. And what she finds out later on in her marriage is it's not coming true for her. American beauty Kristen Rossum, everything was coming up roses. She was funny. She was smart. Oh, I thought she was just beautiful. There's something about her that men find enchanting. She catches your eye. She had a promising career and a new husband who adored her. Greg loved her more than anything. But the pretty face hid a vicious secret. Lies, addiction, and murder next on Snapped. smart, Kristen Rossum had made it. At age 24, she was already making a name for herself in forensic toxicology. Her husband worked for an up-and-coming biotech firm. They had a trendy apartment in San Diego with sleek, modernistic fittings and seagrass rugs. Their nights were filled with late-night parties and expensive wine. For Kristen, a perfect life had always been on the agenda. 
Born into a world of privilege in the elite college town of Claremont, California, she was groomed for success from day one. She's talented, she's intelligent, she's pretty, she's a child model, she was a ballerina, she was Phi Beta Kappa. She grew up in a community where status, power, acclamation of others was extremely important. And in addition, her parents were particularly sensitive in promoting that kind of appearance by having her uh, perform, having her trained in modeling in the theater. Her father was a professor of political philosophy at nearby McKenna College. Her mother taught marketing and directed the nonprofit graduate programs at Azusa Pacific University. They probably instilled in Kristen a sense of, you know, it's very important to do well, it's important to be successful, it's important to be smart, and that was probably a great deal of pressure on a girl like Kristen as she was growing up, that she had to be perfect. A knockout even as a child, Kristen learned early on that blondes really do have more fun. She was one of the most attractive women in her high school. I can picture her standing out in front of the library with a jean skirt on. And looks weren't all she had going for her. She was just a lot of fun to be around. I think everybody had a good time with Kristen. She was funny. She was smart. She was a little rebellious. She smoked cigarettes and drank, laughed. Impulsive and gutsy, Kristen loved anything with a touch of danger. She was always into doing something that's exciting with an adrenaline rush. So we went bungee jumping, and she just loved it. She's laughing the whole time. Her desire to live on the edge sent her on an impulsive trip to Tijuana, Mexico in 1995. She was a student at the time, but the pressure of college life was getting to her. In Tijuana, she hoped to find adventure, but what she found was love. She decided to go to Mexico and just travel around because she was just tired of it. She couldn't take the stress of, of the just going to school, um, trying to be the good person. She goes to Mexico, and it's almost like it was Faye. In Tijuana, Kristen bumped into a young college student named Greg de Villers. She thought he had nice eyes. That night, they drove to Greg's apartment in La Jolla. They were never apart again. Greg loved her more than anything. I mean, he just, he was crazy about her. In October 1996, on Kristen's 20th birthday, Greg gave her a dozen American Beauty roses and a diamond ring. Greg got a degree in biology the following year and took a ground floor position at a growing biotech startup. Kristen was fascinated with chemistry and graduated summa cum laude from UC San Diego in 1999. The couple married on June 5th in an outdoor ceremony in Claremont. He loved her and you know, wanted to help her. Um, he, was a, he seemed like a really good, nice person. He, on the wedding tape, he, he just said, she's the most incredible person that I've ever met, and I just can't wait to spend the rest of my life with her. After a honeymoon snowboarding in British Columbia, the newlyweds settled happily into their trendy La Jolla del Sol apartment. Kristen went to work in the San Diego medical examiner's office. It was an exciting job. As a toxicologist, she found herself handling crime scene narcotics like heroin, oxycontin, methamphetamine, and fentanyl. She was a hard worker. She did what she was told. She was bright. I think I met Kristen Rosen back in... Gosh, I want to say 1999 at a conference. She was trying to get into the field. She did a platform presentation in which you basically get up on stage and present your scientific paper. And it was about a death involving strychnine. Kristen's boss was an Australian toxicologist named Michael Robertson. He was young. He was energetic. He was a, a very bright scientist. Michael's specialty was fentanyl, a rare painkiller, a hundred times more powerful than morphine. And it will seriously depress your respiratory system, make you stop breathing, and you will die from it without properly managing the airway. Since Kristen also worked with fentanyl, she and Michael shared a mutual interest. Soon, the two began attending drug conferences together. She obviously was riding the coattails. Obviously, if someone's standing next to you, you're going to be introduced to a lot of the key people in the organization. 
A picture book marriage and a skyrocketing career, the future looked rosy for Kristen Rossum. But roses, as everyone knows, Happily married to her college sweetheart, Kristen Rossum had it all. Talent, ambition, good looks, a devoted husband, and a promising career. You're a pretty girl. She's got her whole life ahead of you. She's talented. She's intelligent. She's pretty. Her future looked to be as bright as she was. But on November 6, 2000, something very dark stopped Kristen in her tracks. 911 emergency. arrived at the La Jolla apartment, Kristen led them to the bedroom. There, lying comatose on the floor, was her husband, Greg. He was covered with red rose petals. Nearby was the couple's wedding photo. It was a scene right out of Kristen's favorite movie, American Beauty. If you've ever watched American Beauty, the theme of the movie is two people trapped in this loveless marriage, and there were many rose petals used in this movie. While paramedics tried desperately to revive Greg, the cops questioned Kristen. Her husband hadn't been feeling well, she said, and stayed home from work. She checked on him at lunch, but when she came home that evening, he was unconscious. An hour later, he was pronounced dead at Scripps Memorial Hospital in La Jolla. Tearfully, Kristen told the cops that her perfect marriage had gone sour. That very morning, she had told Greg that she was leaving him. Despondent, he had taken his own life. There was no note, but nothing about Greg's death suggested foul play. At the hospital, the San Diego medical examiner ruled Greg's death a suicide. Suicide notes are, are common, but not universal in suicides. Typically, a suicide note is for the purpose of having an impact on the people who remain, the audience. Kristen immediately signed papers to donate her husband's eyes and skin for transplants. The rest of his body would be cremated. Less than 24 hours later, San Diego homicide detectives received an urgent call from Greg's brother, Jerome. He just didn't buy it was a suicide. Um, it was a suicide allegedly by drugs. His brother was extremely anti-drug. There was just something not right. Greg's family got an injunction to stop the cremation and ordered an independent autopsy. This investigation really occurred because of the decedent's family saying this is not right, he would have never done it, and actually stop the cremation. The results of the autopsy blew everyone away. Not only did Greg have clonazepam, the date rape drug, in his system, he also had high levels of a powerful and rare opiate, fentanyl. He basically put him to sleep, and he couldn't breathe for himself, and he died. And there was more. We had a conversation with Dr. Blackburn where he believed that the autopsy results showed um, that Gregory DeVos had been in a coma for several hours, and then the fentanyl was introduced. And basically, at that point, he was telling us that this man could not have given himself the fatal dose. If Greg didn't give himself the fatal dose, that meant someone else did, and that meant he was murdered. Very early on, we're looking at, okay, this must be a homicide. Not surprisingly, Kristen became the prime suspect. Fentanyl was her specialty, and when they checked the drug locker at the San Diego Medical Examiner's office, they discovered that 15 skin patches of fentanyl were missing. All three of the cases where fentanyl was missing from, Kristen Rossum had worked on the case. When detectives brought her in for questioning, they were shocked at her appearance. When I walked her up and, and really was kind of watching her and her movements, my first thought was, this is a doper. I knew I was looking at somebody that was a meth user. I've worked a lot of drug cases in my career, and she looked like a drug fiend. Kristen's dirty little secret was out. She was a methamphetamine addict. It is one of the scarier drugs I've ever been exposed to. It induces paranoia, it makes you react ag aggressively, it clouds your judgment, it does everything bad after the first few times you use it when you feel so good. She had uh, a pipe hidden in her lab at work that they tested for methamphetamine and had her DNA on it. And it turned out Kristen had been using for a long 
time. She confessed that she had started using meth in high school. She said it made her feel euphoric. It, it helped her with schoolwork. If she had this pressure coming from this wealthy family of her, of her having to be highly educated, that type of pressure could easily lead her to sort of seek excitement and to do things that were sort of not in character with what she was supposed to be. After graduation, Kristen's addiction took over. It nearly destroyed her life. But then, in 1995 in Tijuana, she met Greg DeVillers. She was um, strung out on drugs. She didn't have a place to live. She didn't have money. So early on, he filled certain needs for her. And I think he had a need to help her and fix her. She flees to Mexico, and right at that very minute, bumps into Greg. And Greg becomes the rescuer. He takes over the role of her parents. He's the one that's going to keep that perfect image for her and hopefully, in her mind, hide or somehow do away with the nasty underbelly of drug use, dishonesty, and destructiveness. The cops also learned she was sleeping with her boss, Michael Robertson. Kristen had come up to me and said that they were together and that they really loved each other. I remember telling Michael that, you know, getting involved with a subordinate or extramarital affair is just crazy. Women typically cheat for emotional reasons. They may not be getting something emotionally. For Kristen, it was probably excitement. She's the kind of person who really craves excitement. And just to be with a man like Greg, who is very stable, probably seemed smothering to her. Kristen admitted that Greg knew about Michael and had threatened to ruin both of their careers if they didn't stop seeing each other. But she vehemently denied any involvement in her husband's death. For six months, the investigation dragged on. Then, on June 25th, 2001, the cops made their move. Kristen was arrested on charges of first-degree murder and thrown in the county jail. Kristen's parents paid her $1.25 million bond, then picked her up at the jail in their new Mercedes. But the bloom was definitely off Kristen's rolls. Would the jury believe that a poisoned marriage drove Greg to an American Beauty suicide? Or did Kristen give him the lethal dose? For beautiful blonde Kristen Rossum, life had gotten ugly. Her husband Greg was dead, poisoned by a rare and powerful painkiller, and she was charged with the murder. Opening arguments began on October 15, 2002, in San Diego County's Superior Court. If convicted, a promising young toxicologist faced life in prison without parole. Because it had so many sexy elements to it. There were just your basic drugs, sex, adultery, intrigue, international people. They were all attractive. They were all educated, good-looking. And these are the people that you don't think this happens to. But it did happen, of course, and prosecutors put the blame squarely on Kristen. They portrayed her as a lying, manipulative druggie, a woman who from day one had screwed around on the husband who loved her so. And they had the emails to prove it. They're very uh, passionate uh, email between Kristen and, and Michael Robertson, and yet, the very next email would be something with Kristen and, and Greg. But love didn't kill Greg DeVillers, pointed out the defense. Poison did. People aren't mistakenly poisoned. They such a lethal uh, poison involved that, that is not available easily at all. This was, from the very start, first-degree murder or suicide. As Kristen's lawyer, of course, he argued for suicide. Her defense put on witnesses who claimed Greg had grown despondent. The defense claimed Kristen's affair and her problems with drugs were pushing him towards the edge. Well, maybe he was depressed, returned the prosecution, but depression had nothing to do with the way he died. The man was in a coma. A man in a coma cannot overdose on fentanyl. And besides, where would he get such a rare drug? She stole drugs. She stole them from the medical examiner's office. We have absolute evidence of her stealing meth for her own personal use. It's striking that a former or present drug user 
will take to the field of toxicology, the study of drugs, and its negative impact on human beings. We see on one hand her becoming this perfect expert on the harm of drugs for people, and then being able to completely disregard that knowledge and information in her personal life and use drugs to destroy herself and eventually the people around her. What's more, witnesses for the prosecution told the hearing Kristen brag about having found the perfect murder weapon, fentanyl. Even more incriminating, her lover Michael had recently written a paper detailing a fentanyl murder. Investigators found it on his computer. The case that he cited it was a homicide that occurred a considerable amount of time before Greg DeVillers was murdered, where fentanyl was used as the method to kill the person. The defense argued that this was all just circumstantial. It didn't mean Kristen had anything to do with Greg's death. There is no direct evidence that she did it. And they actually don't know how the drugs got into his body because there was never any way to prove that. But the prosecution did have a theory as to why Kristen would want her loving husband dead. Kristen wanted Greg dead when she felt that he might betray her. She felt that everything she worked hard for, being a toxicologist, working in a, you know, prestigious office, here was someone who was going to, ex you know, she felt her husband was going to expose her affair. Um, he was going to expose her drug use, and everything she had was going to come crashing down. And she probably felt the only way to um, make sure that didn't happen was to make sure that Greg was no longer in the picture. But motive didn't guarantee a conviction and neither could the evidence. Without direct proof one way or the other, the outcome of the trial would depend almost entirely on how the jury felt about Kristen. It would really come down to the believability and credibility of her on the stand. Uh, without much backup or explanation, uh, just a raw reaction to her denial of having killed her husband. Kristen's testimony lasted three days. She did really well the first day, and then the second day and the third day, it became more and more evident that she just kept lying. She was an incredible liar. I think, um, to some extent, maybe it's because she, Krista believed her own lies. One of those lies had to do with the rose petals strewn over Greg's body. Kristen said it was one last act of love on his part, covering himself with her favorite flower like a scene out of her favorite movie. But a grocery receipt dug up by a paralegal in the prosecutor's office told a different tale. At 12.41 p.m. on the day of Greg's death, when Kristen Rossum said she was feeding him soup, that she had purchased a single rose with baby breath bouquet uh, from the Vaughn store. It was a bombshell. It was an ugly picture prosecutors were painting. But through it all, Kristen relied on the one trick that had served her well all her life, her powers of manipulation. She would cry, she would dab her eyes, she would make faces at the jury. She tried to basically evoke sympathy. She would kind of give a face that was sort of, you know, please feel sorry for me. Closing arguments were made on November 6th and 7th. 2002. I, I thought it came down absolutely to the impression she made on cross-examination and the conclusion of each individual juror as to her cred credibility and reliability. The jurors were out less than eight hours. Their verdict? Guilty in the first degree. On December 12, 2002, Kristen was given life without parole and incarcerated in the Central California Women's Facility in Coachella, California. Why somebody of privilege, why somebody with intelligence, with beauty, with everything that she had going for her, why she would get involved in this murder and just basically self-destruct. Um, I think you have to look at the dope people very carefully to, to really understand why. Greg became a threat to Kristen when he indicated that he would reveal to the world at large that she was not the perfect American beauty. This was completely intolerable to her. And as in the movie, the source of that irritation 
the source of that threat had to go. Maybe. Or maybe it was just a simple case of real life imitating art. Bookkeeper Deborah Baker had it made. Her boss was a Texas millionaire. Uh, Jerry was a, a very significant person, a lot of money. And his wife just happened to be her best friend. They were very, very close. I mean, closer than sisters. But when this threesome suddenly became a twosome, only one of them would pay. Outside Wichita Falls, Texas, Deborah Lynn Baker was living the life she'd always hoped for. All I ever wanted was to be married and to be a good mother. And never career minded or anything. That was my fairy tale. Married to Tony Baker in 1975, the couple had a son, Charles, the next year. Me and my husband were childhood sweethearts. Been married 28 years. She had a High school son who played football, was well-liked in the community. I couldn't find anybody that had anything bad to say about them. When the manager opened it, he found papers belonging to Jerry Sternadel. He immediately called the cops. They got a search warrant before they went over there. And then when they did go over there, in the storage locker, they found a bottle of arsenic poison. The shed was rented under a fictitious name, but the address was Deborah's home in Holiday, Texas. That was enough for investigators. They may not have been able to get Luann, but they were going to get Deborah. On May 14, 1993, they arrested her on the charge of first-degree murder in the death of Jerry Sternadel. The cops hoped it would be a two-for-one deal. They get Deborah, Deborah fingers Luann. But it didn't work out that way. I always got the same response from anyone. We don't think you did it, but we think you know who did. But Deborah wasn't about to play that game. She insisted that she was innocent and refused to roll over on her friend. If somebody told me she did it, if she told me she did it, I would have a hard time believing it. I just do not believe it. It shows a tremendous bonding and loyalty that she would serve to protect Luann. And one would look, in that case, for Luann to repay her loyalty with financial incentives. So nearly three years after Jerry's death, Deborah Baker sat all alone in the Clay County Jail. With all the evidence against her, it looked like Deborah was facing life in prison. But looks can be deceiving when Texas justice has the final word. Deborah Baker was no longer home on the range. Her millionaire boss was dead of arsenic poisoning. Deborah was charged with his murder. And her best friend Luann, the boss's widow, was basking on a beach somewhere in the Bahamas. The cop's only hope of getting Luann was if Deborah talked, but Deborah had nothing to say except not guilty. Her trial began on January 18th, 1994. Charged with murder in the first degree, Deborah was facing life in prison. She didn't look confident, but I don't know if that was an act or what it was, but she did act confident that she wasn't guilty. From it. Deborah had it. Second, money. Deborah stole thousands of dollars from Jerry and was about to be fired. Third, Deborah was constantly in Jerry's home and was bosom buddies with his wife. The defense claimed it was all circumstantial. But prosecutors plowed on. To explain to the jury how a victim dies from arsenic poisoning, they called in a medical toxicologist. Arsenic is a so-called heavy metal in the family with lead, mercury, cadmium, and other heavy metals. 
symptoms and causes severe nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and agitation. And shortly after follow liver dysfunction, electrolyte loss, and death. Women choose poisoning of infants much more often than men do. It's an indirect hands-off method. It keeps one's hands at some distance and allows the woman to feel, I haven't killed him, the poison has. The defense didn't dispute that arsenic killed Jerry. Their argument was that the amount of poison in one juice jar couldn't have been fatal. And Texas is full of arsenic. Jerry could have been exposed somewhere else. They were considering other sources of the arsenic poisoning. Any of the chemicals he used on horses, he had a bottle of mercury that he played with all the time. I had told the doctors about that, and they had even said that it contained arsenic. But the prosecution tied the arsenic straight back to Deborah Baker. She had it in her storage shed. The defense had a ready answer for that. There's no proof that was her shed or that she had ever touched the arsenic bottle. Her fingerprints weren't on the, the container. Uh, no one ever identified her as the person renting that storage locker. But Deborah had a motive to kill Jerry, said the prosecutors. More than $30,000 was missing from his bank accounts when she was bouncing his checks all over North Texas. But Deborah wasn't bouncing those checks, said the defense. Debbie never had access to the bank account. She was not on Jerry's bank account, could not write checks. They never traced any large amounts of checks to Debbie. When their evidence didn't work out so well, the prosecution attacked Deborah's character. According to witnesses, her relationship with Luann was downright steamy. It was my belief that Deborah Baker and Luann Sternadel were sexually inclined toward each other. I did go to the house one day. I knew her and Debbie were both in there. And when I uh, finally got him to come to the door, uh, Debbie was, was, was uh, buttoning her blouse up. Gossip and innuendo didn't make Deborah guilty of murder. And, the defense pointed out, Luann Sternadel wasn't on trial. Luann might not have been, but oddly enough, Jerry was. It's a legal custom peculiar to Texas justice. Well, in Texas, uh, the defense of a murder case always puts the character of the deceased <laughs> in issue. It's kind of a Texas murder defense is that the person's that was the deceased was uh, uh, not a person that anyone cared particularly about. The defense had a field day with Jerry's character. Everyone in Clay County had a story about him, and every one of them was bad. My dad was a very powerful person. A lot of people may have, you know, wished him dead. He could break you. He, he could make sure that you didn't make money, that you didn't have a home. Jerry's sex life was as checkered as his business dealings. He was a womanizer. He, uh, he liked women, and Luann stayed with him, even though she knew he had had mistresses and that uh, he, had, uh, he had done some pretty bad things. They even brought it into trial about him sleeping with his stepdaughter and having a girlfriend and buying her a house. Closing arguments were made on February 1st, 1994. The jury had a lot to consider. Jerry died from arsenic poisoning. Arsenic was found in Deborah's storage shed and in a juice bottle at the ranch where she was living. Jerry was threatening to fire her over missing money. Finally, there was the question of Jerry's character. Was Clay County better off without their millionaire plumber? The jury took five hours to reach a verdict, and when they did, it was a shocker. Guilty of murder in the first degree. The moment the decision came down, pandemonium broke loose in the courtroom. If the family is delighted because Deborah Baker was convicted. Deborah's son didn't take it so well. When the guilty verdict came out, he went nuts. The deputy sheriff had to grab him and keep him from going towards us. He also attacked reporters who tried to interview his mother. And the reporter and the cameraman pretty much sprawled out at the bottom of the stairs, and we picked our way through that and got out of the courthouse. At the 
sentencing hearing the next day, everyone was on edge. With a first-degree murder conviction, Deborah was looking at life in prison. Finally, the foreman stood up. The sentence? Ten years probation and a $10,000 fine. People couldn't believe their ears. I mean, he killed somebody in a horrible death and he got probation. I didn't think I was right. Nobody could do anything. The only thing you heard was the loud laughing of Deborah Baker. Ten years later, North Texas is still talking about Deborah Baker. There was definitely the idea that she did not do this alone and that whoever did this with her was actually the person who did most of the work, if not was the mastermind of the plan. It's frightening that two women who people don't like to think of commit murders could join together and plan and commit a murder. One gets a minimal sentence and the one gets off scot-free. If Deborah Baker had stayed out of trouble, she never would have spent another night in jail. But in December 2003, she was arrested for parole violations. She is currently serving 10 years in the women's prison in Gatesville, Texas, and still has to pay her $10,000 fine. she wanted. Typically people that are born, you know, with privileged backgrounds are used to getting what they want. Um, also, there's kind of a, a reward system in place with that where they can ask for what they want or demand what they want and act out in certain ways and typically end up getting rewarded for that behavior by getting ultimately what they want. So that ultimately this trains a person to be a little more assertive and aggressive. Carolyn wasn't just blessed with money and looks, she was smart too. After graduating in psychology from the University of Michigan, she earned a master's degree in elementary education at New York City's prestigious Columbia University. She got her first job in 1987 teaching computer science at Greenville Elementary in Scarsdale. It was a coveted position. If you're a school teacher uh, working in the Yetchlan School District, either in Edgemont High School itself or Greenville, or one of the other uh, lower grade schools, um, you're pretty much head and shoulders above some of the other uh, teachers in the surrounding areas. And best of all, the school was close enough that she could still live in New York City. With her new degree and great attitude, Carolyn excelled at Greenville. She really was an excellent student and well liked as a teacher. At Greenville, Carolyn met a popular sixth grade teacher named Paul Solomon. When you're a sixth grader, you idealize your teacher. And Paul Solomon was one of my two favorite teachers in Greenville. Paul Solomon was a, a macho type guy. He had a motorcycle. Physically, he was uh, in good shape. He was involved in the phys ed department. And Carolyn was awed by him. Paul lived with his wife, Betty Jean, and teenage daughter, Kristen, in nearby Edgemont. It looked like the normal, average American family, working, going on vacation. 17 years older than Carolyn, Paul immediately took the young first year teacher under his wing. So he could serve as sort of a father figure for her, somebody more stable, more secure, more experienced, all of those things would be attractive. Soon Carolyn was one of the Solomon family, dropping by the apartment for long chats with Paul and staying for dinner. She paid special attention to Kristen. She Carolyn may have been a big sister to Kristen, but she became more than a daughter to Paul Solomon. Much more. By the end of the school year, the stylish young teacher and her hunky mentor were getting sweatier than gym class. It wasn't the first time Paul had taken up with another woman. Luckily, his wife was understanding. They 
had an open, no question, they had an open marriage. They spent the entire summers together with their own group of friends. And the rest of the year, they did whatever that suited them. For Paul, the affair was a little more than a fling, something he'd done many times before, which would prove to be a big problem because Carolyn wasn't used to hearing no, and she was serious about Paul Solomon. Deadly serious. Various Carolyn Warmus had it all. Looks, money, and an exciting new career as an elementary school computer instructor. She was very organized, very a timely person, uh, very good at her job. Her first year mentor at exclusive Greenville Elementary in Scarsdale, New York, was an older teacher named Paul Solomon. Paul was her mentor when she began teaching, and they worked very closely on a daily basis. Paul had become a father figure to Carolyn, and then much more. But the relationship was doomed to end badly. The only question was, for whom? On Sunday, January 15th, 1989, Paul's daughter, Kristen, was away on a ski trip. At 6.30 that evening, he left his wife, Betty Jean, at home and headed down to the bowling alley. When he returned five hours later, his life was turned upside down. The 911 call came in at 11.42 p.m. It was Paul. When police reached the apartment, they walked into a grisly scene. Betty Jean Solomon was found face up on the floor between a couch and a wall. There was a, a large amount of blood on her and on the area in which she was lying. Paul's wife was dead. From the moment they saw the body, investigators knew that this was not just a random killing. Betty Jean Solomon had been shot at close range multiple times. There were nine wounds, there were nine bullets recovered. But typically, you have a, a large number of bullets, and that's indicative of some extreme anger, hostility, um, rage. Step by step, the investigators put together what had happened in the apartment. From the forensic evidence and the shell casings that we found, and the different entry wounds and so forth into Betty Jean Solomon's body, uh, she must have been fleeing around that apartment and running. And then it's very clear that shots were fired uh, into her while she was on the ground. Bloody footprints on the back of Betty Jean's sweatshirt showed where the killer had stood to pump in those final bullets. But for such a brutal crime, the room was strangely undisturbed. There was nothing overturned, nothing out of place in the living room area. So it would me to believe that the person who was responsible for this knew the victim. This is somebody she knew and trusted. And that somebody the cops suspected was Paul. When there's a murder in an apartment, they assume, or the police look into the possibility, that the spouse committed the crime. By his own admissions, he was the last one to see the victim alive, and he was starting to find the body, and he's a husband. So obviously, he, uh, he was our initial suspect. Paul insisted he didn't kill his wife. Then a routine question turned up a startling revelation. We asked him, you know, well, do we know anybody that could have done this? Why would anybody want to do this? And if it wasn't you, and that's when he gave us her name. The name was Carolyn Warmus. It was true Paul had gone to the bowling alley that night, but he didn't stay. Instead, after dropping by to see his buddies, he headed out to a local restaurant to meet Carolyn. He had a couple of drinks. They went back outside. They got into um, her car. Um, they had some sexual involvement in the car. Paul told the cops that for over a year, he'd been carrying on with the sexy young teacher. Lately, though, he'd been trying to break it off. It was just getting a little too much for him. She was being a little bit too possessive. But the more Paul pulled back, the more demanding Carolyn got. Paul claimed that when he missed her birthday, she totally freaked out. There's this desperate fear of abandonment, and whether it has to do with her background, her family background, or personality traits, that she has this need to hold on to people in her life. Paul's story and his grief were convincing. He looked uh, visibly shaken. He, he looked like a man that had found his wife lying dead on the floor and didn't know he was going to find that before he came in the house. I don't know anybody who was that good an actor.
Soon the cops had a new suspect and Paul Solomon had immunity, as long as he cooperated fully. Next, they brought Carolyn in for questioning. I sent a couple of detectives down to uh, see if we could get her and brought her into headquarters. Carolyn appeared shocked that something so terrible had happened to someone she knew so well. She just couldn't understand why anybody would do this. Said that she was no way involved in it. But that was all she had to say on the subject of Betty Jean's murder. If Carolyn wouldn't talk, though, the cops could at least find out who she'd been talking to. So they subpoenaed her phone records. I sat there and did a very tedious and, and, and uh, boring task of identifying each phone call that was made and plotting out a calendar with a time, the time frame, how long the call lasted. Several of those calls were made to a Manhattan PI named Vinny Parco. Vincent Parco is the typical stereotype private investigator uh, in this city of New York who everyone looks up to. Swashbuckling, very uh, large ego, you will overwhelm you. Parco immediately gave the cops an interesting tidbit of information on Carolyn. It turned out Paul wasn't the first married man she'd been obsessed with. She had hired him to trail one of her married lovers in New Jersey. And that was all Parco would say. It would have to be the end of the interview. Except the cops had something on the PI. We received information that Vinnie Parco was in possession of a 25 caliber uh, jet fire. And it wasn't registered. Which had just happened to be the type of gun used to kill Betty Jean Solomon. It took a promise of immunity, but Vinnie finally spilled his story. Yes, he'd had a 25 caliber automatic, but he didn't have it anymore. He had given it to someone. Carolyn Warnes. And she went to him and said she wanted a gun for protection. And that wasn't all. A machinist friend of Vinny's in Brooklyn had made her a silencer for it. We did uh, some search warrants, and we came up with uh, George Peters, and that he did make this silencer at Finney Parko's behest. Cops were never able to find the gun, but Peters told the cops he'd test fired it with the silencer in place. And at the machine shop, buried in sawdust and metal shavings, they found shell casings that perfectly matched those from the murder scene. So here we got the shell casings from a gun that we can put in Finley Parko's hand, who in turn puts in Carol Warmer's hands. And there was another of Carolyn's phone calls that fit into the puzzle. This one was to a gun dealer in New Jersey the afternoon of the murder. When detectives visited the shop, the clerk remembered a blonde buying 25 caliber bullets. A female fitting Carolyn Warmer's description was out there. Buys his ammunition with a with a, with a phony uh, ID. When they traced the ID to a woman who had worked with Carolyn two summers before, they decided to go for an indictment. On February 2nd, 1990, Carolyn Warmus was charged with the murder of Betty Jean Solomon. Bail was set at a quarter of a million dollars. Her daddy, of course, paid it. Prosecutors were confident they had enough evidence to convict Carolyn Warmus even without the murder weapon or any witnesses. But convicting the millionaire heiress of murder would be far from easy, and a missing piece of evidence would make all the difference. Carolyn Warmus always got what she wanted, including, according to the prosecution, the death of her lover's wife. Now she was facing life in prison for the crime. Her trial for the murder of Betty Jean Solomon began on January 14th, 1991. People lined up outside. There were celebrities that were coming in to, to, uh, to watch the trial. It was in the newspapers every day. The, the TV cameras were downstairs every day. It was a media frenzy. Alone in the dock, charged with murder in the second degree and facing 25 years to life, Carolyn still looked like a million bucks. She wore clothing that normally you don't see um, murder defendants wear. It got to the point where there was a reporter that was so caught up in what Carolyn was wearing that she referred to it as witness wear daily. There was not one man in that courtroom that did not stare at her. 
In their opening statements, prosecutors laid out their evidence against the beautiful heiress. Her affair with the victim's husband, her link to private investigator Vinnie Parco, her connection to the murder weapon, and her ammunition shopping trip to the New Jersey gun shop. The defense countered by telling the jury that Paul and Vinnie were nothing but manipulative liars. They accused prosecutors of having no hard evidence whatsoever against Carolyn. There's not a single piece of direct evidence that links her to the murder. They did not have possession of a gun that did the shooting. There are no witnesses. Nobody saw her in that building. In lieu of direct evidence, prosecutors presented a carefully linked chain of circumstances, beginning with Carol's excessive relationship with him. But in the cross-examination, the defense put Paul on the defensive. I was able to turn to him in front of the jury and say, uh, but you will never be judged or prosecuted for the murder of your own wife because you received immunity. Uh, it's a blow to the credibility of a witness. But when the prosecution turned to Vinnie Parco, they began to score points. He knew about the gun. He sold the gun. The gun was the caliber and type that the forensic lab said was the type used in the, in the killing. No one could put that gun in Carolyn's hand except Mr. Parco, who gave it to her. It was powerful testimony. Too bad it was from a guy like Vinnie Parco. The defense had a field day with him on the stand. Vinny wove so many tales, it was really difficult to discern which of those tales was 100% accurate and which of them was embellished. Um, and David Lewis made Vinnie Parker look like a fool on the witness stand. I thought he was kind of like a thug. None of us believed Park guy. But the most damaging testimony wasn't about guns or sleazy PIs. It was about Carolyn's own sordid past. It came out in the trial was that she had had a number of past relationships with men who were not available to her. When Carolyn couldn't have the lover she wanted, prosecutors claimed she stalked him. I found the originals of threats that she made to a guy who she loved, she fell in love with in college. He was engaged to be married to the point where he had to get a restraining order to uh, keep her away from the wedding. There was also the married bartender in New Jersey Carolyn had hired Vinnie to tail. She wanted the photographer to take photographs of her in these various stages of dress and undress. And she had pictures of this guy that was the bartender. And she wanted this photographer to superimpose him over some other body. And she was going to mail him to the guy's wife. But a thing for married men didn't make Carolyn a killer, did it? After four long months, the fatal attraction murder trial finally boiled down to a string of circumstantial evidence. She actually killed Betty Jean was not something that the evidence showed. And that was my position with the jury. And on April 17th, 1991, the decision of Carolyn's guilt or innocence was turned over to the jury. It would be a long time coming. A day went by, then another, then another. Finally, 10 days later, the jury returned. The courthouse was packed with spectators and press waiting for a verdict, but there was no verdict. Jurors announced that they were hopelessly deadlocked. On April 27th, the judge declared a mistrial. One year later, Carolyn Warmus was tried for a second time. Everything was basically the same as in the first trial, except for one key piece of new evidence, a black cashmere glove. The crime scene photos showed um, a glove next to the body of Mrs. Solomon. At the first trial, the prosecution was unable to explain what happened to that glove. It had disappeared. At the second trial, the prosecutor came in and announced that lo and behold, they had a new piece of evidence. The glove suddenly materialized again. Paul Solomon claimed he had found the bloody glove three years after the murder in a box of old clothing. The pattern of blood on the glove had suggestions of uh, perhaps having been made by four bloody fingers, having been sort of laid across it. But DNA tests failed to identify the blood as Carolyn's or anyone else's. There was no evidence that Carolyn had any marks or cuts or anything on her. That blood, if it was real blood and it was on the glove, would not be Carolyn's under any formulation anybody's given. 
Carolyn denied ever owning the gloves. However, a receipt found by detectives showed otherwise. There was a, a pretty good purchase record for credit card a slip that she had purchased uh, this pair of, uh, of black cashmere gloves. When the trial ended, the jury took only six days to reach a verdict. They found Carolyn Warmus guilty of murder in the second degree. At a sentencing hearing on June 26, 1992, the judge called the crime merciless slaughter. He gave Carolyn 25 years to life in the women's correctional facility in Bedford, New York. But the questions still linger. Why of all the married men she had affairs with did Carolyn choose to kill Paul's wife? Was Paul so special? Or was Carolyn just tired of looking for Mr. Wright? It could be that she was more attracted to him than other people. Or it could be that last time it didn't work. Like she tried all kinds of different methods before and nothing worked. She wasn't able to keep the man. This time it escalated to the point of murder.